what do you say to those who have that that concern? Like, can I really create a customized experience where um, the client, the prospect is enabling, I'm enabling them to create this product that then I have to deliver? Yeah, well, it's much easier than you think. The behaviors make it much easier. One of those behaviors is that a seller engages in two-way dialogue with me, the buyer, as opposed to telling me or making assumptions they engage in two-way dialogue. Well, we Mm -hmm. all know how to do that. If you want more two-way dialogue, you just ask better, higher quality questions. I cover that in my other book based on research, which is uh, Discover Questions Get You Connected. So if you're not comfortable, you don't know how to craft great questions, that's the skill to work on because that's how you get people to have their own relevant, meaningful experience. It's all about them when you're opening it up with questions. All right. Now, you had mentioned there were six behaviors. I don't think we did an overview. A shared vision, enabling others to act. What are the other four? Yeah, so there there are six behaviors under each practice. So the five practices of exemplary leadership are what you're referring to. And they Mm -hmm. are model the way. That means to know your values and to align your actions with your values, to do what you say you're going to do. They're they're the ones that are most about credibility. Model the way, Mm -hmm. inspire a shared vision, which we talked about. But literally, that means to breathe life into the vision that you share over and over and over again. We have to keep it alive. The third one is to challenge the process. That's about innovation. It's about taking some risks and, and learning. It's about um, being able to even think about the steps it would take to make something happen and then holding others accountable to it. So there's some process within that. Uh, But it doesn't have to be complacent and it doesn't have to be status quo. It's about thinking what's new, what's next. Enable others to act, we talked about. That's collaboration and and bringing your buyer in, dignifying and respecting them in that way. And the fifth Mm -hmm. one is to encourage the heart. That's the visual for that, if you can imagine it, is um, encourage means, literally, to pour courage into. So where are we going to pour this courage? Not the brain, not the the, the physical body, but the heart. So it's emotional. And this is all about praising and recognizing people. It's about um, buoying them when the going gets a little tough. If if, uh, they're having difficulties, you you encourage them along the way. You don't just wait till the end and contract is signed and you say thank you. So I'm curious to know, based on your research, how firms can elevate the conversation with prospects beyond price. Okay. Well, first, everyone should know, it's not, not our research, but there's quite a bit out there that, that demonstrates that customers, clients, they're very happy to pay more for an experience that's relevant and meaningful. So that's how you overcome commoditization, experience is now the differentiator. It used to be value added. Before that, it was customer service. Those have all been equalized. If you want to stand out, it's, it's the experience. This is the experience economy. How do you elevate? Well, you, you don't go in and, and immediately answer price questions. You have to answer them sooner rather than later because people are asking and they expect answers. But you have to make sure that by then, you've asked a couple of questions. You've shown how you are different and how you're creating the experience. And you might even say something like, you know, we could talk price. Is price the only thing that matters to you when you choose a financial advisor? Get them to tell you what other things matter. That's an experience, too. No, oh, I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, so I'm curious to know, like, what other insights has your research discovered um, about how innovative companies convert prospects into clients? Well, um, innovative companies often make extraordinary sales because they're willing to be nimble. There's a story from a seller that we tell in the book where um, this company actually changed sort of their business model because of this opportunity and the seller seeing the opportunity. Uh, The seller's name is Ted Hyman. The company uh, is Active Identity. And Ted found out about a U.S. government Department of Defense opportunity to bid on a project that was actually a matter of national security. They had to redo ID badges for every single member of the military. 
if you can imagine. <laughs> and wow. um, yeah. yeah, huge project. And Ted knew that his company could do some, but not all of what was being asked. But he wasn't quite sure how they would navigate the four different branches of the military and all the other political factions that would be involved in, in bringing this together and making something happen. But rather than just saying no, he took some steps to try to find ways, and the company was willing to allow for that innovation, even up to the point of collaborating with a competitor so that together they could make it happen. And they did. And in fact, the the company won the Gracie Award, which is a government award for a contribution, a technology contribution. And they gave Ted a letter of commendation because he literally solved this problem of national security. So the answer to your question using that example is you have to be willing to be nimble and to do things that you haven't done before. That's where innovation comes from. Yeah, there was a guy named um, D. Hawk, and we can all thank him because he's the inventor of the credit card. He was the president of Visa Bank way back when. And um, he has this quote. His quote is, I hope I say it right, something like, Mm -hmm. the problem is never how to get new ideas. The problem is how to get the old ones out of the way. So the reason that everybody talks about innovation and very few are successful with it is that they are um, constrained by their old ideas. They're constrained by what they think it looks like or how they think others are going to to envision it. They don't stretch. But when we do get innovations, they're itty-bitty incremental, and that's fine, right? We're building towards something. But if you want the the big possibilities kinds of innovation, you have to move away from what's in your mind. Now, does either of your books help with that process of formulating, kind of breaking the old paradigm and shifting into a new one? Well, the practice called Challenge the Process is about innovation. So there are six behaviors that, that come with that practice. And yes, mm-hmm. they they help to move you toward that. But it's not a book about innovation. It's it's just you know, okay. going to get people started. Okay. Um, I'm curious to know, like, what action steps would you encourage an advisor, whether they are new to the business or they've been in it for 30 years? Like, what's a good next step, especially those who are looking to grow their practice? But they want to do it differently, right? Because there's a lot going on with digital marketing and social media and how do you get people? And it seems like it's all very much data driven and automation and it's losing that human component. Like, what would you say? Here's some practical action steps you can take. The first step, I think, is to develop outsight. Uh, That's not the same as insight, which we all know, but outsight's a real word. (laughs) It means Mm -hmm. looking at things that are different, as different as possible from what you already know. Outside would have you doing things like, if if you are a financial advisor, it would have you not looking only at your own company and how your company does things, whoever you're, you know, associated with, but it would mean looking at other companies. It would even mean going outside the, the financial field, looking at how they do things everywhere and just continually being curious. Well, you know, what is what is going down the Chipotle line mean to me? How can I apply this kind of thinking in my business? Outsight is, it's fueled by curiosity. And the curiosity mm-hmm. questions that'll get you there are what's new and what's next. Be hungry, be, be ravenous for finding out how you could do something a little different. Tell me a little bit about your first book, The Discover Questions That Get You Connected. Sure. Uh, that book's a little over five years old. It continues yeah. to, to do very well. It was named um, by HubSpot using Amazon rankings. It was named one of the top 20 most highly rated sales books of all time. So I was really honored to be on that list. Uh, it's a book that teaches you how to ask questions. It does not give you scripted questions, but it gives mm-hmm. you eight different purposes for asking questions. It's based on 20 years of field research with sellers from virtually every field and interviews with their buyers. What did the buyers think of the questions that the sellers were asking them? So those DISCOVER is an acronym. Each of those letters stands for a different purpose for asking a question. And when you 
when you know how to ask questions well, you can very efficiently, very effectively get the information that, that you need and you can be engaging your buyer and getting them to think about their vision and to think differently. And while you're doing all of that, you're building trust with them because of the experience those questions provide. So I'm curious to know, with all the research that you, both like you and uh, was it uh, Barry and James have done, what's new and what's next for selling? And, and just the sales process and, and the leadership process, I'm curious what trends you're seeing. Oh, there are so many, and there are so many conflicting thoughts about this. I mm-hmm. believe that selling is going to eventually, hopefully in the next few years, it's going to marry two things together that people seem to think are in conflict but don't have to be. I think this human element of selling is going to become more profoundly important, and I think companies are going to begin offering more training and being more selective in who they hire so that that is a, a core competency that, that they instill in salespeople. And at the very same time, I think that AI and machine learning is going to help us in selling. It's going to do some of the background work while we do the front and center work. It'll liberate us. It'll free us up so that we can do more of the face-to-face, the human-to-human piece. But we have to get smart about it. We, I think right now there's a misunderstanding and in some cases an over-reliance or an expectation that that tech stuff is going to do something that that it doesn't or that we allow it to replace things that, that we ought to be doing human to human. So that all has to get sorted out. And when it does, I think it's going to be awesome. No, oh, interesting. Now, what do you think as far as you, you would say, you know, we're relying on it to replace things that should be human to human. What would you say are those core things that should always be human to human that you just can't automate? And if you do, you do it at your own expense connections with people. You can't Mm -hmm. open a sale with a machine. We all know we can spot a chat bot when it pops up. We know Mm -hmm. when we're getting canned responses from help desks. We also know when we're getting uh, automated emails uh, in some kind of a sequence from our sellers if they don't take time to personalize them. We all know that, you know, when we go on LinkedIn and somebody invites us uh, and then immediately follows up with a sales pitch, that that's also Mm -hmm. something that was um, mechanical. Even if it's not a machine that does it, it will be in the future. But even if it's not a machine doing it for you now, you're looking like a machine, a robot. That's not connecting. Getting Mm -hmm. someone to to accept your invitation to connect, that's not connecting. Human to human, either picking up the phone or writing a very um, specific email to that individual because you did a little research about them, that's what we need. I'll give you a great example of where two things can match up. Mm-hmm. If you don't mind m- mentioning a very specific piece of, um, of technology that I love out there. Go for it. The, okay. So there's a thing that nobody seems to know about. It's called crystal nose. So that's like crystal mm-hmm. ball and then mm-hmm. you know something. Crystal nose. And what this does, it, it syncs up with your Gmail and it coaches you as you write a, a mail, an email to someone. Because what Crystal Knows has done is it goes into LinkedIn and other social media and it knows what's out there about people. It it collates it. So if you've got somebody that you're interacting with that has any kind of presence on social media or in the news, Crystal can then analyze that using sort of, you know, personality assessment information. And it will and it will tell you things as you're writing your email, like, hey, you need to put more data in here or make your sentences really short. This is somebody who likes to see things quickly. It tells you the voice to use that will be appealing to this person. And I've been using it for a couple of years. I'm still writing the email. I'm still personalizing with the information I found. But Crystal's making me smarter in how I connect uh-huh. with that person, communicating the way they want to be communicated with. Kind of scary, isn't mm-hmm. it? Kind of creepy. Yeah, it <laughs> it totally is. But it's but it's good to know because it takes the 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 question as to, you know, this cold prospect. I feel like with especially with social media, there's so much information that people put out there about themselves and their companies. It, then the thing the issue becomes well how do I spend the time or I don't have the time to then uh, dissect all of that information and know, you know, the personality profile I'm dealing with. But 
That's amazing. Crystal knows. I've heard of it high level, but I have not officially used it. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Awesome. Well, then lastly, how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about stop selling and start leading or just some of the ideas that we've talked about? Well, um, LinkedIn's a great place to start or mm-hmm. you can certainly email me. The, the website for my company is People First PS. The words people and first are spelled out. PS stands for Productivity Solutions, People First PS. And, you know, come on over there, join our community. Uh, we we give a lot of stuff away. So um, it's, it's high value. It's not going to be junk mail. Oh, good. That's good to know. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your insights, Deb. I really appreciate it. Well, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Sonia, for having me speak with your group. Mm-hmm. 